Hello, hello. Welcome to the Future City Educators webinar for 2017. Um, before we get started um, on the webinar, um, if I could get just a couple people um, to um, on the webinar control panel, if you could um, click on the hand raise button, um, just so I can be sure that um, you all can hear me and I'm not just talking into the abyss. Uh, great, thank you, thank you. Very good. Well, thank you for joining us uh, for the um, first ever um, Future City Headquarters sponsored Future City Educator webinar. Uh, my name is Jake Williams. I'm the Future City Competition Program Coordinator. Also on the line is Maggie Dressel, the Program Manager. Um, and we're so excited to um, have this opportunity to talk with all of you. Um, a lot of educators have told us that they wish they'd known X, Y, or Z uh, when they were first starting out um, doing Future City. Um, or they'll say, I didn't find out about a specific resource or strategy until they'd been doing Future City for many years. Um, so this webinar is an opportunity to kind of combat that, to kind of uh, bring up some things that we think might be useful for either educators who are brand new or um, for those of you who have been around for a while and just want to um, get some some strategy and best practices and advice. So to start out we have just a little bit of um, housekeeping. The platform we're using is GoToWebinar. Um, if you're having any issues with the sound quality um, you can dial in on the teleconference with this information here. If you'd like to take a screenshot or write it down now, just in case you have any issues, um, you can use that and still see the, the screen, but call in on the conference line. Also, the recorded webinar and the slides are going to be posted on futurecity.org in the resources section by the end of this week. So if you'd like to go back and look at um, anything from this webinar, or if you'd like to forward it to a friend or colleague um, who wasn't able to make it today, um, it'll be up there and available. Um, how to ask a question. Um, during the webinar, um, you can type a question into the question space, uh, the little chat box on the control panel. Um, and we'll pose as many of these questions as we can um, to the panelists at the end of the webinar. So now I'd like to introduce our fantastic uh, panelists for the day. Um, Carol Reese has been teaching since 1974. She currently teaches at the Ains Independent School District at West Ridge Middle School in Austin, Texas. In addition to serving as the sponsor for the Future City program, Carol coordinates the Campus Debate Club, the Model UN, the Elementary School Steam Days, and the Student Stock Market Game. Uh, welcome, Carol. Thanks for joining us. Hi. Glad to be here. Also with us is Danielle Lawton Barker from Southwest Middle School in Lawrence, Kansas. Danny um, is beginning her 22nd year in gifted education with 17 of those in the middle school level. This is her 10th year doing Future City. Uh, Christopher Storm, a civil engineer, has been Danny's steadfast engineer mentor for the past decade. And as of last year, Danny is also um, co-working with teacher Jamie Shaw, her school's engineering teacher. So together, the three of them are working with 54 students on four teams this year. Hi, Danny. So great to have you with us. Hi, great to be here. Thank you. So the teams of both our guests uh, placed in the top five at last year's international finals um, with West Ridge Middle School taking home first prize. So we're going to start out with a couple different um, topics and just kind of hear from our, our two guests. Um, to start out, let's talk about team size. Uh, different educators choose to have a wide variety of different kinds of teams. Um, there's three official presenters, one educator and one mentor. But most future city regions allow for more students to be on the team, and it all depends on your needs and resources and the interests of your students. So Danny and Carol, could you tell us a little bit about your approach to team size and what advice you have to others? Um, sure. Uh, Danny, did you want to go first? I know yours is a classroom setting, so a little bit. Sure. Different. Yeah, um, the way that we run future city at my school, it's, it's kind of co-curricular. So we do part of it in class and part of it outside of school. But because we do use a class setting, my teams tend to be bigger. Um, up until this year, um, our region has limited the number of teams that we could have, so we've only been able to have 
three teams that would go to the regional competition. This year we can have up to five. But we have a lot of kids at my school that are very interested. So um, that's kind of, of course, the team numbers. Last year we had a team of 29 um, with one of our two teams. And that was actually the team that did advance to nationals. And it was definitely a different strategy. Usually I have about 12, yeah, mid-teens. Um, this year I think we have four teams and each of them have 13 to 14. Okay. Um, at our school, at Westridge, um, we do not have it as a class, so the students sign up for it as an extracurricular activity. Um, but I work with them during what would be their like advisory period, their their homeroom period type time, and um, during lunch. And then I'll stay after school um, and help the kids um, as we need to. Um, the the team sizes are typically anywhere from three. I think uh, we did have one year where the team grew to about 17 kids, but typically somewhere between three and 13 kids on a team. Um, and we've had up to, I think, six teams. Um, well, I take that back. One year we had 11 teams, um, but then we found out that our region uh, required that we have um, more like five after that. So um, that that 11 team year was definitely um, um, interesting. It was it was a lot of a lot of students involved. Um, we typically have mixed grade teams, but you can have um, teams of all sixth, all seventh, all eighth, and that works too. Um, we find too that we try to mix up who is on the team as far as girls and guys, so it's not just all girls and not just all guys. Mm -hmm. So that's great. So let's uh, move on to a little bit of the team structure that kind of relates to this. Um, could you um, each talk a little bit about um, how you form and assign team roles, how you divide up the labor, um, how your teams work, um, and they kind of structure themselves, how involved are you, um, and, and some of those kind of questions. Okay. Carol, do you yeah. want to go first? Um, oh, sure. You, you go, Danny. Sure. Okay, sorry. Um, sure. So um, because we do have some class time and then we do quite a bit of after school time as well, um, I have the kids really watch each other work on some of the preliminary things that we're doing. Like lately we've been researching potential places they might build their cities. Um, and um, they watch each other and they learn a lot about the competition and then really think about their own skill sets and usually I have them, we're, we're not there yet, but usually I'll have them divide themselves into different sub teams. So I usually have a sub team that focuses on um, each of the deliverables basically, except for the presentation. We don't worry about that until later um, because for the way I've done it, really they can't even really come up with a presentation until they've written their essay and, and really thought about what they want to express. But um, so then they'll elect a leader for each of those sub teams, and then they also those are project managers, and they elect a principal in charge that's kind of their team captain. Okay, and we do more or less the same type of a thing. The students sign themselves up for um, their their team groupings, and within that, they are uh, advised that they need to pay attention to skill sets. Um, they need, they know they need to have, for example, somebody who is pretty good with the playing SimCity or virtual. Um, city design kinds of tasks. They know they need a good writer. So they try to um, make sure that the team um, has that in place for um, the composition and then the roles are also assigned then much the way Danny described. We have sub teams, um, team kind of leads for each of the, the deliverables. Um, we try to find that try to make sure that there are at least two to work on each deliverable. Um, if you have less than that, it's a lot of work for one person. Um, and if you have too many, then um, you need to make sure that there are specified tasks so that nobody is just sitting idle. Um, 
the kids um, basically it's a combination of, of their self-choice for where they feel they fit um, skill wise and also um, my own observation having seen the kids working um, as to you know where, where they really should fall uh, in terms of the team roles. Great, excellent. Um, moving on to team setting, uh, both our panelists are teachers um, and as they've already mentioned um, one has an in-classroom and one is an after-school uh, program um, but a team's educator isn't always a classroom teacher, a club or program administrator um, or a homeschooling parent um, can all be future city educators um, but no matter what the setting that you're in uh, it's important to create an environment for the kids that's encouraging and productive um, so could our panelists talk a little bit about the setting and environment that you work to create uh, for your teams? Um, Carol, would you like to start? Sure. Um, the first year we did it, uh, we did 100% of the work in my classroom after school. Um, and we found that um, that worked to a point because the kids were here. They could come in before school at lunch, you know, during advisory or whatever and work. But um, we did find that there were some other students that would come in the room who would be very interested in looking, for example, at the development of the model and maybe they would touch things that they shouldn't. So it's important if you're going to use your classroom as the setting um, that you have a kind of a dedicated space so that it's um, safe and secure. Um, and we divided it up even now um, when the kids are working here after school uh, I usually ask for a parent host to offer their space in a garage so that for the model building part of it they can do that away from um, others fingers <laughs> prying eyes whatever uh, because now we have multiple teams as well so the kids tend to be um, interested in keeping their solution kind of private until a little later on. Um, so we do use somebody's uh, garage for the model building part and um, that's how we set it up. Um, so we, we do pretty much everything here at school um, with the exception of when I assign research to them or um, different writing tasks to them. Um, so yeah, I've used my classroom. This year I actually changed classrooms and I'm right next door to the engineering teacher with whom I'm working, which is great. And we have a little section off of her room that we're going to be able to store things in, which is kind of wonderful because Future City did take over my classroom for much of the year last year. And then my model UN groups and reading groups and other groups had a hard time finding clean spaces to work. Um, but yeah, I think I try to make sure that each team has something somewhere that's private to their team because it is all happening here so that if they bring trash that they've been collecting, especially for their model, that it's safe to their team, which is a challenge sometimes when they all want to, like uh, Carol was saying, kind of poke around and see what each other is doing. Um, Mr. Storm, my mentor, built these really nice um, carts that we can roll the models around on, especially when I was in my old room because there wasn't anywhere to put them and so that I could at least roll them into the corner and they have shelves on them so that I could put, you know, all of the trash that they were collecting and the buildings that they were in the middle of making kind of on the shelves. That's cool. Great. I want to say, um, just throw in that I did start a, a collection of storage tubs and so each team could put the recycled items that they were collecting into these tubs. And as we did some reverse engineering in our classroom, um, kids would take apart things and find really interesting little bits. Um, we had a kind of a, a storage spot where kids could, quote, shop for recycled things, which really was helpful for all of the teams. Very good. Yeah. We do that too. Um, one thing, one thing I would warn folks when you do have kind of shared areas, lots of times I have to be straightforward with kids that you can't hoard all the cool stuff. If you don't know what you're going to use it on yet, you can't just keep it on your team's table. So True. FYI. We do that too. In fact, I have a shopping day for recycled materials and I let a representative for each team go through the line once 
and then the next team has a representative go through the line and they can choose one thing each time um, and that way it helps to make it more fair for cool stuff to be divided out amongst everybody. Very good idea. Great, so uh, moving on to time management tips. Uh, time management is something that can be difficult for people of any age, um, but could the two of you talk about um, what kind of steps you take for yourself, but also to encourage your middle school students um, to think about their time management and make smart choices when it comes to future city? Uh, Danny, would you like to start? Sure, um, I, I'll say up front, this is a challenge for me as an adult, so um, it's definitely, this is, um, pressed my boundaries in terms of helping kids because I'm trying to support them in doing this really complex project. Um, I really enjoy the change, the add of the um, project plan because I think that makes the whole planning process much more, um, I guess, explicit to the kids and for them to really take part in it so it's not just me setting deadlines. I try to have them brainstorm if, if this is the deadline for your essay, I want you to back it up a week for the draft that you think is final, which probably isn't, and then back it up another week for a draft that you think is pretty good and it probably isn't, and that kind of thing. So I try to have them kind of task manage it and backwards plan, and then we post a lot all over the room, or like when they do have their individual team areas, they'll be able to post things. Um, like last year we posted lists on the carts that each of the teams used. Um, lots of reinforcement of look at your timeline. Usually on Wednesdays it's kind of a team meeting day when the different sub-teams report their progress and then the principal in charge with my assistance will kind of push them to are you getting done what you need to get done to make your deadline. Okay. And we do about the same thing here at Westridge. Um, we try to begin with the end in mind and work backwards so that um, the kids understand that um, they need to um, set these deadlines um, realistically for themselves. If they're involved in sports, if they're involved in, um, you know, if there's a holiday or something like that around those times, um, they need to, to be realistic about how busy they're really going to be. So we do tend to, um, as Danny said, kind of set the deadlines with the kids doing the the work of looking at the calendar to be realistic about, you know, if this is due on this date, realistically, how much time are you going to need to get that done? Um, and we typically would meet uh, for discussions uh, different days after school, but uh, Friday seemed to be a popular day and then for uh, when we got to the part about the building stuff that would happen more on um, Sundays but the the subgroups would meet in between those times so uh, it didn't all happen on a weekend as far as time management the kids understood that you know they were going to need to uh, take ownership of certain tasks and uh, and try to get those ready for the next team meeting to be able to share what they their progress. Mm -hmm. Good, very good. Um, so we've talked about different team sizes and whether it's a team of three um, or 30 kids, we regularly hear uh, that the members of a successful team um, are in part successful because they communicate with each other both well and often. Um, so could you talk a little bit about um, how you encourage and um, uh, promote positive communication uh, for your team members? Uh, Danny? Um, sure. Uh, well, the kids are always way more hip to new tools than I am, I will say. Um, we love using Google Drive. Like, uh, Jamie, the other engineer teacher, she and I have set up a a team drive for each of the teams um, so that they can store kind of their works in progress and their research notes and all of that and the team drive that's accessible to all of them. We're a one-to-one -one school district and so all of our kids have iPads which is great so they can take them home and get on the Google Drive as long as they have access to the internet but we also have some Khajiits that kids can check out from our library if they don't have internet access at home so that they can have access. Um, I know that the kids lots of times 
create their own group text. Um, and we've used GroupMe before as well um, for the kids that have cell phones. And here at Westridge, um, we also have uh, the one-to-one, -one, we have the iPads here as well. And so um, that's been really fabulous, but we understand that not every district across this country would have that, but um, but if the kids have cell phones or whatever, they can iMessage, they, they often text each other. Our kids used Skype a lot to meet during the week when they were at their own homes, if they had conversations that needed to happen. Um, they all used, we used Google Docs um, that could be edited by anybody on the team if they were at the stage where they were doing some um, of the planning stages or or even brainstorming, writing essays, things like that, they would put that into um, a document that could be shared. They also used um, a platform called Slack for communication. Um, they would, some of the teams would talk to each other on Slack. Um, and then there was another tool that we used to use. We're not using it as much anymore, but it's called Today's Meet. And um, it's free. You, If you sign up and get yourself on an account, you can set the timeline to save every conversation for up to a year, which really works well for a program like this one where the conversations can then be um, tracked back if you're saying, well, do you remember in October when we were talking about la la la? They can just scroll back and find it um, and it's all saved in an easy, easy easily accessible way. Mm -hmm. Um, so moving on to uh, the team mentor, the mentor um, is a STEM professional who acts as a role model to the students. Um, they're an official member of the team and they offer a window into the world of engineering, planning, or a related field. Um, lots of mentors get involved because they know the students. Um, so check with your team to see if there are parents or family members or a family friend um, who might be interested in becoming a mentor, becoming your mentor. Um, if you can't find a mentor this way, um, you can check with your regional coordinator. Uh, they might be able to match you with a mentor. Um, you can find this by going on to futurecity.org. At the top of the uh, page, you'll see Find My Region. And if you click on that, you can find your regional coordinator um, and get their contact information. So now we'll delve into some of the resources that you can utilize to get the most out of Future City. Um, there's two kinds of resources we'll talk about. First, um, these are called um, what we call local resources, um, things in your own backyard, not directly connected to Future City, um, places like universities, community colleges, town hall offices, um, local councils, city planner or manager's offices, uh, construction companies, engineering societies. Um, there's opportunities for things like field trips um, or having speakers come to your class or after school meetings. Um, so could our um, panelists talk a little bit about your experiences um, and share um, how you've utilized some of these types of resources? Uh, Carol, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, we are very fortunate to have the University of Texas in our backyard. And um, so we have used uh, different departments, different um, professors have uh, been kind enough to, to speak with the students when they've had questions. Um, and we do take uh, field trips just to places around. Um, I imagine, you know, this coming year we'll probably be wanting to maybe chat with some uh, elderly individuals to find out what they feel might be um, some of the issues since that's related to this year's theme. Um, but we have made phone calls, Skype calls, um, and um, definitely have found that by reaching out to the people in the community, it's, it's really helped the kids uh, connect to the theme and to help the kids get some ideas or some inspirations for, um, for directions they may want to go. Hi. Um, yes, we two are really lucky. We have uh, the University of Kansas here in Lawrence. And um, either the kids or myself are pretty regularly emailing experts, um, especially once they develop their innovations. And um, a couple of years ago, I had a team that was basically teaching itself chemistry because their innovation was very much 
a chemical engineering innovation. And so I couldn't really judge if they were on track or not. So we, um, one of the girls one day in class said, is it all right if this professor comes to our class tomorrow? Because I just emailed him and he can. I'm like, okay, sure, yeah, that's fine. Um, so definitely we use lots of university and private engineers and architects in town when we have questions for them. Um, something that we've done the last, last year was our first year, but my colleagues here in Lawrence, we set up a day that we called the Future City Leadership Retreat. Um, and it's for all the middle schools here in Lawrence who are participating in Future City. And we've called on some different experts from um, KU and K-State and um, private individuals. My uh, engineer mentor who's here, he's going to be one of the folks that speaks there. And it's really going to be just like a jump start for all these teams to kind of really learn some great information about the topic and also about engineering. Like Chris, my uh, mentor, will be presenting on things that engineers do in the city. So he is uh, on the private sector and then he's going to have a city engineer working with him too. And so they can just give the kids like a concept for what is it that engineers do here in Lawrence. Um, that was a really cool day last year. We're doing it next Friday, actually, um, this year. So hopefully it'll go well. We have about 150 kids that'll be there. So it should be cool. That's excellent. Great, excellent. Um, so the other type of resource um, is what's offered by Future City. Um, and the cornerstone of all this is the program handbook, um, which you can find um, as a PDF um, for free online. Um, and you can also request a hard copy from your regional coordinator. Um, does, uh, um, Danny, would you like to start um, just uh, kind of your thoughts or advice for someone who's um, new to the program, who just kind of has the, the program handbook? What would you, um, um, think they should know to start out? Um, well, first of all, be kind to yourself. <laughs> but um, I think what would have helped me my first year, I didn't even finish the first year I tried this. Mr. Storm tried to help me, but I didn't really know what I was in for. Um, and so it was really nice to have a mentor teacher help me the second year I tried when I did finish. Um, she kind of helped me each week I would just call her and say, so what are you doing this week? So that she helped me build like a time management um, I guess, map for myself for the year because, like I said, that is not my forte. Um, but I think there are so many great resources in this book and on the website. Today I was just doing the some of the infrastructure uh, scavenger hunt, actually, with my kids. Um, but I think lots and lots of copies of rubrics and reminding your kids, look at that rubric all the time because um, really they need to understand, like, this is what you're being asked to do. You're, you're the engineer here. This is what your client needs you to do. These are the specifications of what your client expects from your project. And so you need to look at that all the time. So that's my advice. And uh, we treat the uh, handbook as a kind of a, a classroom Bible for anybody who's participating in this program. Um, and again, uh, the the, the statement, look at the rubric, look at the rubric, look at the rubric, is made over and over and over again for the same reason, because the kids really need to understand that um, ultimately that is what is um, being asked of them. And even though they may want to get really creative about something else, um, that's fine, but they still need to make sure that they've honored all of the requests um, that are listed in, in the rubric. Um, I love the fact that this book really does include everything you would need to know. It's, it is a real treasure for um, resources. It has uh, links and the website as well, many, many links to help the kids really get um, straight what it is that, um, that they're working on. Um, it can be overwhelming, I think, at the beginning. Um, like Danny, the first year I did it, um, we made errors because uh, we kind of skipped over, I think, some of the things that were requirements and, um, and necessary items. So be kind to yourself. I was, I was laughing when she said that because I was going to say the exact same thing. Sit down with a cup of tea or something and just in a leisurely way, flip through and use sticky notes, mark the things that 
are you think are going to be helpful for you and um, and then just keep that by your side it's a tr tremendous resource one one other thing I'll just kick into I totally agree with everything Carol said um, one thing I've kind of figured out the last few years is when the kids do divide into their sub teams lots of times I will print off everything out of the booklet that has to do with that particular deliverable and give whoever is the team leader a copy of that so that they are helping me because again I need all the help I can get to get things done on time and so they are really the first front of making sure that we're following the rubric and then I can just kind of remind them over and over. Great. Yeah, and actually related to that um, is our next slide. Um, we, we have heard in the past, um, gotten feedback from educators that um, the structure of the um, handbook in the past could be kind of overwhelming and confusing, especially when it came to um, the way that the um, resources were structured. So starting this year at this um, um, handbook that we have now, um, it's divided into a way that um, we think will be uh, a lot more user friendly. Um, so you should read through the whole handbook first, um, but once you your teams kind of start in earnest, um, the appendix is available and it's broken up into each of the five deliverables. Um, so it starts out with the project plan and it has um, overview information about the project plan and then it has um, resources um, and all kinds of useful information and then at the end is the um, rubric for that. Um, and then the same is true for Virtual City after that, and then the essay and the model and the presentation. Um, so you can use these appendix um, to um, kind of really easily see where everything is laid out for each specific um, deliverable. Um, and as was mentioned before, um, the resources that are available online um, are very, very useful. Um, so futurecity.org is filled with them um, and they're very easy to access. Um, if you go to the top of the page um, where the Find My Region button is, on the far left is resources. Um, and from there you can filter by um, different categories to make it easier to find what it is you're looking for. Um, so for example here you can see um, you just uh, mark the box that you're interested in filtering by and then click apply. Um, information on downloading and playing SimCity um, is in the um, SimCity uh, tab. Um, there's rules and rubrics where you can see and easily print out the information um, that you can also find in the handbook. Um, but as both Danny and Carol mentioned, paying attention to those rubrics, really focusing on them is really important so you can access them directly here. Um, there's also ideas and starting points for research and research resources and websites um, and webinars and videos is where things like this recording um, will be uploaded. Um, so you can search for more than one thing at a time but it's a great way to kind of um, sift through all the information that's available. Um, and one of the best things you can do to strengthen your team um, is show them an example of what a top scoring essay or presentation looks like. Um, because as we've mentioned, Future City can be overwhelming at first. Um, seeing an example of the final product is really, really valuable. Um, and so you, anybody can do this. Um, you can access this by the gallery section, which is next to the resources. Um, and from here, you can read essays from past winners and watch the um, presentations from the finals. Um, so this is a really good opportunity, especially if you're, you kind of have a sense of what Future City is, but um, you know, seeing it you know, actually um, happen um, or actually reading those essays um, really makes a difference and is really helpful. Um, so now we thought we'd take um, just a, a couple minutes um, to go through um, Carol and Danny um, how you approach or any advice you have about the specific deliver deliverables. We've already talked about the project plan and how useful that is for planning. Um, but uh, Danny, would you like to start with um, just a little bit of um, info or recommendations for approaching the virtual city? Um, well, I'll say this is probably the deliverable that challenges us the most. Um, it partially just because it's changed a bit in the last couple of years. Um, and so I think my approach this year is, um, again, going to be go back to that rubric 
and what is it they're really asking you to do because it, it is different than what you guys used to ask us to do and uh, I wish I could say that I knew more about being good at the virtual city. The other thing and you already have this on your slide but lots of times like I regardless every year it's hard for us to get SimCity on our computers <laughs> and um, I still am not sure that we have access to it yet on all of our school computers so that is something like communicating with your IT department like if you haven't already do it now because it can take time to make it happen. The one thing I would add and this is Chris the engineer mentor because I kind of try to work with the kids on this and we're still trying to figure it out but take more screen captures than you ever thought you would need because once you get past a certain point there's no way to go backwards. Yeah. So. Yeah, and my kids really like seem to be challenged by that. Um, so one of my teams last year we started over many a time. Yeah, yeah. What one, one of the teams last year literally had to recreate it within 24 hours because they figured out they didn't have any of the right screen captures. So, oh, right. I and hope we get better at this. For those of you who are listening to this um, and and wondering what, what that means. Um, it, instead of just playing SimCity and then submitting your final city, this time you're being asked to show the development of the SimCity in stages. And our kids are so eager to just make progress that they forget that they need to make these screenshots pretty much starting, like Danny's saying, from the beginning. Um, and so, yes, we also have started over um, because they didn't get the right screenshots or they would shoot the, or take the screenshot at night and you're really not supposed to do that. It, they want you to try to get a screenshot during the day um, of the in the SimCity world. So, um, yes, we've, we've had to go forward and then take three steps back and then start over and that's okay. It's a great learning experience for the kids. Um, we have found that uh, we, the, the third little statement about each student doesn't need to work on their own separate city is true. Um, we do find that the kids will share the development if we have one lead working on the Sim City, on the virtual city, um, they'll share it and then get the rest of the kids to kind of gather around either on a screen um, if we're able to project or um, just physically stand around as they are um, talking and and thinking. Mm -hmm. I hope that makes sense. Yep, definitely. Good. Um, so, and just a reminder, if anybody um, watching has any questions, you can you can type them into the question box um, and we'll get to them um, at the end of the, the webinar. Um, uh, Carol, would you like to start with um, any information and recommendation best practices for the city essay? Um, yes, that's um, we definitely have um, we try to pick kids that are are pretty good writers. Um, there are multiple ways you can approach the the task of writing this essay. We have students who are good writers who also can be good editors. So if you're going to have a team of students contributing sections to the uh, final product, then you need a student who is capable of taking that information and kind of creating one voice so that the essay doesn't sound really disjointed. Um, and uh, But other times we'll have kids just offer the feedback and then one writer will try to you know just go ahead and and write the piece completely themselves and then turn around and come back to the team for feedback and for um, for the team to edit so there are multiple approaches to how you um, can write this essay again having the entire team contribute and then one person serves as the kind of overseer and master writer or the other way around where you have one student who you know listens to the ideas goes home writes something and then comes back to the team and then they edit from there um, we also uh, one piece of advice would be to um, let the the writers write everything add everything that you could possibly want even if you go over the word count and then cut from there because if you start worrying at the very beginning about word counts, then um, 
you're going to potentially leave out something that's really important. And um, you do want to follow the rubric. Follow the rubric. We had students in here uh, every single week last year. Um, they would they would write. They would come in and edit, and then go away with you know more suggestions and come back the next week with their new version. So it was definitely um, a writing process, and um, they uh, they uh, they need to take that seriously and not just try to whip it up the night before. Um, yes, I, I agree with everything that Carol just said. Um, I often use a similar approach with my kids, like get, get all those ideas down. We'll worry about the word count later because, yeah, you don't want to stifle that idea development. Um, usually I have teams of kids working on the essay just because of the, my team numbers. I have, um, you know, probably at least six kids working on it. On my huge team last year, what we had to do was we had two different essay teams and it was kind of like dueling essays. Um, so they would meet, talk about some things, go kind of brainstorm and write not well written, but just write some ideas down, get together, kind of argue it out. And um, basically they were trying to create two separate essays and then meld them, which was not an easy process. <laughs> um, but it, it did make them really entertain lots of different possibilities. So if you have a gigantic team like we did, that was one way to kind of get everybody's voice written down. Um, and in the end, obviously, you only have a hundred, you only have fifteen hundred words, but at least their ideas were considered. I would say, um, yes. Also, to the idea that this is a process, I often tell my kids they will probably hate me by the end because, um, you know, a lot of these kids think if you write one version or maybe two that they're done. And I would say that the essay probably goes through. 20 to 25 versions before it's done. So um, I wholeheartedly echo that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so again, like earlier on one of the slides, there was something about you need time to fail. And if there's anything I've learned over this 10 year period of doing this is that that is more true than you could ever imagine that you the kids will fail at things and they need time to fail so that eventually they can learn from that failure and make something really cool. Important to learn and not always super easy to learn. Right, or fun sometimes. Right. But. <laughs> um, so but moving on to... Oh, oh, yeah. I was going to throw in that one year um, we had a team that wrote an entire essay, did all of the work, um, tried to you know, finesse it, um, spent weeks and weeks on it, and at the end they dumped the whole thing and started over. Um, so it, it can be, um, like Danny was saying, you know, a situation where, um, you know, they, they look at you like, what? Um, we have to do this again. Um, but it's so worth it because in the end they come up with something they're really, really proud of. Yeah. Also, one other thing to throw in, just because I've learned this the hard way, be so careful with your word count because <laughs> I think um, earlier on, I had a team that I don't think they were understanding how um, the word count works in Word and how their words and their images that they had input weren't counted. And like a 10 point deduction is super stinky when kids have worked so hard. And I felt bad that I didn't catch it before it was too late. So yeah, be careful with word count. Make sure you hand count all of the words in your images in your essay. Very good advice. Um, on to the model. Um, Danny, would you like to start with um, uh, background or comments, recommendations about um, the model deliverable? Um, sure. This is, this is another part of it that really kids need a lot of time to fail on because they, <laughs> they dream up some really amazing ideas, but making those ideas like 3D and two scale and functioning is a whole nother matter. Um, so this is something I like to start early, like exercises like we'll do something like let's pick a stadium that really exists in the world and you guys try to model it out like in a rough rough model 
at different scales so that they can understand like, oh, if one inch equals 100 feet, this is how big this stadium would be versus if one inch equals 50 feet, this is how big it would be and how much space it would take up. Um, so just giving them lots of times to understand that because that's a really hard concept, I think. Um, also using things like Google Earth where you can zoom down and measure like, okay, let's measure Chief Stadium in Kansas City and see how big that is. But look, the footprint of it isn't just the stadium. Look at all that parking complex around it. Depending on your transportation, you better plan what, how people are getting there and, and do you need space like that. Um, so just a lot of practical exercising and, and modeling out things and a lot of time to realize that it's hard to do, I guess. Uh, collecting lots of trash because <laughs> you never know what you're going to need until you need it. So my room often looks like a dump, but Mine. Um, <laughs> yeah, but it, it's cool. I mean, and everyone in the school knows that and brings me stuff all the time. Like they bring me their broken VCRs so we can dissect them. And they bring me uh, like, oh, I found this weird piece of plastic. Do you want it? Of course I do. Um, so uh, I think that allows them to be very creative in the moment. Like what piece, what would capture what you need here? And is the form following the function of the the building, things like that. Um, and one suggestion I think I would make, I would definitely echo the, the need to begin gathering your recycled materials now, like as soon as possible. Um, and um, the concept of scale is critical. Uh, we, we've seen that just over the years, you know, kids will get excited about a particular piece that they really want to add to the model, but it doesn't fit the scale. And so you either have to adapt the entire um, rest of the model if you're really determined to use that one piece, or you don't use that piece and stick to the existing scale. Um, the other thing I would say when it comes to um, the model is that you want to be careful to think about the maintenance of the uh, moving parts on your model is as you're building if you include the uh, required moving parts but make it impossible to access them so um, if something goes wrong you can't really easily fix it um, that over the years we've learned has um, has been a kind of a critical thing to consider so we uh, typically do a kind of a mock-up the kids will will make a, a, a mini model, like a little demo version of a model um, with their ideas on it. And then we talk about, you know, could you pull this piece out somehow if the circuits no longer function or if the water pump is leaking or whatever it might be. So um, that has been a, that's a, a really important thing to, I think, remember. <laughs> Yeah, I, I would second that. Um, actually, the model that we took to Nationals last year, one of the coolest moving parts they had on it, I don't know what happened to it, but um, it, it functioned part of the time, but not the whole time, and then they couldn't get in and fix it because of where it was. So it was definitely a challenge for, uh, for us because it was just upsetting because the kids had worked so hard on it. It was a really cool moving part, and then they couldn't. Um, they couldn't get in and fix it. <laughs> yep, we've had the same experience. Mm -hmm. And then um, on the slide where it talks about ensuring that the model is sturdy enough to be transported, um, most of the time the kids think uh, about the regional competition and they think, well, I'm going to put this model in the back of my mom's car and it'll be fine. But um, it's always good to think uh, a little bit more in the future and think positively. Ask yourself, you know, could this model sustain a trip to Washington, D.C.? Um, and so you want to make sure that the pieces are, are really glued down or attached strongly enough so that when it makes it to either the regional competition or to um, someplace like, say, Washington, D.C. for national finals, um, that you're not having to completely rebuild when you get to the competition that day. Yeah, we've, we've experienced the, the hard parts of that before. And actually, last year at nationals, 
one team had a board that was really cool that like they could Velcro on and off pieces, which I thought, oh, that's a really smart idea. That is a good. Excellent. Um, yeah, it's one of those things to you, you don't think about until it's it's already time. <laughs> so mm -hmm. the final um, uh, deliverable is, of course, the presentation. Uh, Carol, would you like to start with um, uh, comments or advice about the presentation deliverable? Yes. Um, we do a rehearsal night, and all of the teams um, go ahead and, and practice in front. They practice in a, a setting that's not somebody's house. Um, it's, it, I purposely make it um, a, an open space, kind of similar to the, the size of a, a spot where they might be presenting at a regional tournament, and um, encourage the kids to memorize their talk rather than reading it off of note cards. And the reason for that is that if you put kids with note cards, um, even though they, you, you can tell them eye contact is important, um, they're still going to glance down maybe more than they should at their note cards. So um, I try to encourage the kids to memorize. And if they need some kind of a cheat sheet or something like that, um, let's say they're taking on the role of, say, the engineer for their city or whatever. Perhaps one of their props might be a clipboard, and perhaps on their clipboard they can have little bullet points or something like that just so to help alleviate any nerves if they're worried that they're going to forget. Um, but the presentation itself, um, it's great to include some visuals and to make sure that when the team is presenting, that they're pointing to the visuals, that they're pointing to the model, um, and that there's a trade-off in, in who is speaking so that all of the um, three, because only you can only have three presenters no matter how large the team becomes. So, you know, if Danny has 29 kids on the team, only three are going to be standing up there giving their presentation. Um, and you want to make sure that you have three students who are comfortable with speaking in front of a group and um, comfortable handing off the, the parts within the little presentation and comfortable when they're answering questions at the end um, because the engineer panels will ask the students questions that they may not have um, heard or thought of before um, and they, they do need to be quick on their feet and they need to be able to be sure that all three are speaking and not just one person dominating the entire uh, time. Yes, I, I feel like um, Carol and I have figured out a lot of the same lessons over time, for sure. And yeah, I think ever since we've been doing a dress rehearsal night, which we do it usually about a week before competition, and we'll invite all the families um, to come, so usually it's a fairly packed auditorium, actually, yeah, and engineer, guest engineers. yeah, we'll have guest engineers like Mr. Storm and other engineers will come ask some questions, so it's not just me, um, and it's just a great opportunity for those kids to get a feel for what it's going to be like that day, so hopefully we can get over the jitters, um, and I think they often get much more serious about memorization at that point. Um, Another thing that I would just caution folks, uh, definitely a dynamic that I've seen happen over the years is, you know, because only three kids can be the presenters, um, sometimes there can be jealousies that develop that those are the three kids that talk. And I try to make my kids understand right up front, I, I don't even pick the presenters, I have the kids pick them. But I make them think about all right, if this is the skill set you need, and, and we talk about all those things that you just talked about, like who's going to be good at answering questions, who can think on their feet, who doesn't get scared in front of crowds, things like that, um, that they just really need to honor that we all have a part to play in this project. This is the part these kids are playing. We're, gonna, we're here to support them. We're not going to be jealous and we're not going to um, you know, be catty to them. We're going to support them and make sure that um, they feel supported even in doing things like thinking through, how would I answer a question about, um, like last year, about public spaces? What would be some smart things to say so that they've kind of helped prep their presenters 
uh, for things like that. But then in the end, they, they have to kind of sit on their hands and, and let the presenters take on that role, um, which is a hard lesson sometimes. It is, and it's, but it's so, so, so important, and um, we've definitely had that same experience. Um, in fact, in the team formation part of this conversation, um, I will tell a team that, you know, if you know up front that your team is going to struggle um, with the sharing of, of these different roles and having somebody stand up and, and be the presenter, if that's if it's going to bother you that that's not you, then then yes, you're going to want to reconsider your team formation as you're you're um, creating it. But um, most of the time, I think the kids are able to to appreciate the fact that they are a team and that everybody, as Danny is saying, is contributing equally, even if you're doing something quote behind the scenes. We have um, students in our situation who will self-select. Um, who is going to be the speaker, uh, who are going to be the presenters, and, um, and it usually works out okay. Um, the kids do recognize who are the more sort of charismatic, comfortable presenters, but, um, but they also realize that just because somebody has an outgoing uh, demeanor doesn't mean that they're going to be the best person to be the presenter because they do have to have a depth of knowledge um, that's going to carry them through some tough questioning from some of the engineers. So the idea that the team helps to prep the speakers, no matter who it is that's up there, that's huge. Excellent. Well, um, Carol Reese and um, Daniel Lawton Barker, thank you so much for your advice and for taking the time to talk with all of us today. Um, if you haven't done already, uh, make sure you register now. Um, you can use this link here, um, or you can go to futurecity.org and select register at the top um, in between find my regions and my region and gallery. Um, and just a reminder, if you've participated um, last year, you'll need to register again. You can't use last year's login. I mean, if you're new, of course, um, register and we look forward to having you. Um, so now we have a little bit of time for a few questions. So um, you can type in any questions you have for Carol, Danny, or for Future City. Um, and you can do that now while we're while those are coming in. Um, a quick um, uh, update um, notice: uh, this year we have 36 stipends to give out to Future City educators. Um, they can be used for things like materials and supplies, or for taking your team on a field trip. Um, or travel to the competition, to the regional competition. Um, therefore, you supporting your Future City team. Um, and they're especially for educators that are new to Future City um, and those that are in high need or underserved areas. Um, so be sure to complete the short um, participation survey, which will come up after this webinar. Um, when you're done, it'll come up and um, you'll probably get an email about it too. Make sure you um, complete that survey. And we'll be emailing the applications um, for those stipends um, in the next uh, uh, couple days. Um, Maggie, do we have any questions um, for the panelists? Yes, I have gotten a lot of great questions today and a few I flagged um, that I would love Carol and Danny's input on. Um, Madeline asked, um, she was a little worried because she and her team won't be getting started until late September or early October. And our registration deadline goes through the end of October, so we'll still have teams coming in, you know, all the way for the next month and a half. Do you have any good tips or advice for a team that might be starting a little bit later in the game, um, you know, kind of later September or in October? How can they really kind of jump in and get going? Um, if it's any consolation, our teams don't start until around that time. Um, just because of our school life um, and all the other requirements and things that are going on. So um, don't despair. And I would just say once your team forms, just look at the deadlines, look at your um, calendar, and, and work again. Look at with the end in mind, back everything out, and actually I think you'll be okay. Um, one suggestion might be to... Uh, layer your team so that while you have somebody working on the sim city you might have the kids also working on 
brainstorming, you know, the, the essay and um, thinking about what needs to be included in that and um, collecting recyclables and getting the materials together to start with the build even though you're probably not going to start building until a little bit later. It is doable. Don't give up. <laughs> Great yeah, I would, advice. I would agree. I, I just think, um, yeah, just hit the, hit the ground running. Um, pay attention to those rubrics. Post all your deadlines. I think sometimes I think um, a little bit of scarcity of time is good <laughs> for kids because <laughs> they take it more seriously. Yes. Yeah. Great. We have another um, almost similar question from Susan. Um, she and her team have kind of a finite time um, in which to meet and complete this program. So they meet about twice a week for 30 minutes. Um, and they have about eight kids on their team. Um, do you have any tips on kind of making the best of, you know, have that number of kids, have a very kind of small period of time. They're not sure if they'll be able to kind of meet on the weekends or after school. So any tips on staying kind of like on task and getting things done um, as quickly as possible? Um, on our teams, the, the, the kids got, quote, assignments. Some of them would be asked to do things independent of the meeting times and then bring those things to the meetings. So the fact that the meeting times might be shorter, um, you can still work around that as long as you have dedicated kids. Great. Yeah, I, I would agree. I would say um, just being like super well planned and um, maybe pulling in one or two of those kids to help you plan it out and kind of graph out what you're going to accomplish each each week and each month and then them just getting used to the idea that they probably will have to go home and do their research and do some writing and things like that. Great. Um, and then another question kind of about getting started. Uh, Kristen wanted to know um, kind of what you guys do on the first um, meeting day with your team. How do you get them excited? I know that Future City in the handbook and on our resources website has lots of different activities and kind of background information, but what do you guys do to get the kids really kind of pumped up and uh, jazzed about the program? Well, um, since I get to have this for a class, and I'm working with the engineering teacher, so we're also weaving in curriculum from her engineering class. Um, so that's the challenge, too, because we don't get to just do Future City. We're doing Future City as a part of her engineering curriculum. Um, but what we've started the last couple of years is doing those like breakout lock boxes kind of things, just to get the kids working in teams and having them do kind of um, crazy engineering challenges or just different challenges where they have to carry something across the room using only two fly spotters um, back and forth as a relay just to get them to have fun and to learn to trust each other and work together. That's how we started. That's a, a cool suggestion. Um, for us, we usually just start um, because sometimes the kids don't know each other and sometimes they are already good friends and so um, we typically do start by just kind of looking over the the challenge itself. What what is it that's that's being asked of them? Um, and then you know a little bit about who they are. They introduce themselves. Um, if they don't know each other, they they kind of talk about their their what they think they can bring to the team in terms of skill sets and things like that. So it's more um, it's fun um, because they do get to look at the pictures of of models and presentations from before, we'll show that, and um, and they do get excited, so. Terrific. Um, one kind of specific question about the city model. Um, Susan was wondering, um, or looking for suggestions about what you guys use as the model base, and I've seen everything from cardboard to plywood um, and lots of other things. What do you guys use? Um, we usually use plywood, but and we just kind of at the, each year we take off the previous year's model, like after we look at it and critique it, we take it off and reuse the same wood, usually. We also use plywood now. We started with particle board, but it's really, really um, heavy. Um, and then one year we did have a team that, that used cardboard, but that is um, typically way too flimsy. Great. That is terrific. Um, I I think 
That is it for now. If you guys have other questions, send them in. I'm still responding to a couple of the outstanding questions. Um, yeah, wonderful. And if there's any um, other questions that either didn't get answered um, or that you have specifically about um, the program, um, you can always um, send them to um, info at futurecity.org. Um, I'd be happy to answer those questions. And if they're about specific things um, like uh, SimCity, um, you can see if there's, there's often a lot of um, answers to those specific um, issues in the resources section. Um, and if you don't see it there, um, certainly um, send us an email to info at futurecity.org. Any other questions? <laughs> I think we are good. Great. All right. Well, thank you again, Carol and Danny, um, so much for your time. Um, and we look forward to seeing all the projects that um, come from all the teams. It's thank an you. amazing project. Good luck to everybody. Yeah, good luck, everybody. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.